We've been talking about the mysteries of the kingdom. And to, we talked last week about the second coming of the Lord, that being uh, the Bible talks about two comings, not three. He came the first time the baby at Bethlehem. Uh, the second coming will be in two phases. The first phase of the second coming will be the rapture, followed by the second phase of the second coming, where he will literally come back to the earth and rule and reign for a thousand years. That's what we want to talk about tonight, the king and his kingdom. Uh, Lord willing, should the Lord tear it and it all works out, next week we want to finish this up uh, by talking about uh, the new Jerusalem and the new city in which we will live uh, forever and ever. I think it's kind of ironic in some ways that we're doing it now, this particular study, uh, because in Luke chapter 2, 14, which I didn't have on the screen, uh, when the shepherds were abiding their flock by night, the angel came and said, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. I have never in my day and age that I've lived, I've always heard people talking about peace, peace, peace. The world is full of talk about peace. Uh, we make peace treaties. Nations make peace treaties. Uh, we have alliances to have peace with different nations and people groups. Uh, we have laws that try to bring peace among neighbors and among people. We even have handshake one with the other in order to try to have peaceful uh, situations within our own heart and life. And yet the Bible said when they talk about peace and safety, uh, then sudden destruction uh, will come upon the face of the earth. We often hear newscasts and news reporters and newspapers uh, talking about how there's going to be peace in the Middle East and uh, the Arab peace accords and, and the list goes on and on. And they're building up, oh, it's going to be great and mighty. But the whole time they're talking about peace upon earth, those same countries are in the back room uh, plotting some type of war, some type of sabotage uh, that might transpire within the world. Uh, the same newspaper that talks about the peace that's coming are the same newscasts and newspapers that also talk talk about the war uh, that's running around as well. Uh, may I remind you, we, are, uh, we are, have asked this question, that is this, will there ever be a day when the world will know and experience such a thing as real, real peace? In Jeremiah chapter 8, in verse 11, which I do not have up there, uh, Jeremiah said, For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, Peace, peace, where there is no peace. In verse 15 he said, We look for peace, but no good come, and for a time of health and behold trouble. We look for peace, and yet it cannot be found. Uh, you know, even as Christians, we go to the drugstore sometime, and we buy some sleep in the bottle, but we can't find no peace there as well. But I am grateful tonight that we can talk about that the answer to the peace for this world will not be found at the negotiating tables, will not be found in NATO or any of the other man-made organizations. Peace will only be found and peace will only come to this earth when King Jesus himself, the Prince of Peace, makes his kingdom established upon this earth for the glory of God. The kingdom of heaven is a period of time that's discussed in Revelation uh, chapter 20. It's found in the Word of God. And in Revelation uh, 20, uh, the thousand year reign is mentioned six times in that one chapter alone. Think about that. One thousand year time of peace is mentioned six times uh, there in Revelation uh, chapter 20. Now, some people will call this the millennial reign of Christ. We believe in the millennial reign of Christ. I would remind you the word millennium is not mentioned in the Word of God, uh, but the subject of the thousand year, which is a millennial reign, is mentioned in the Word of God. We do not find the word rapture mentioned in the Word of God, but we believe in the rapture. What do I mean by that? Well, the Latin word for rapture is rapto, which means caught up. We do believe that Paul said we shall be caught up, and for that we're grateful. Thus, we call it the rapture. We don't find the word millennium in the Word of God, but again, that is a Latin word, milla, uh, meaning uh, uh, a, a thousand, and omen, meaning uh, years. So we call it a thousand years, the millennial reign of Christ equals to be a thousand years. The Bible talks about millennial both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. With that being said, the millennial reign of Christ, millennial not mentioned in the Bible, 1,000 years is mentioned in the Bible. Uh, that is what is also referred to as the kingdom of heaven. If you notice in Matthew, he refers to the kingdom of heaven. Luke and others refer to the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of heaven is really talking about the millennial reign of Christ literally upon this earth. Now, there's a lot of scholars uh, who butcher up, if you will, uh, this thousand year reign of Christ. There are some scholars that say, well, uh, the church is in the millennial reign of Christ now. I don't believe that for a moment. 
Uh, the Bible says that Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years. And if Satan is bound now, dear God, I don't want to get here and he gets loose. How about you? So I don't believe he's bound up right now at all. We are not in the millennial reign of Christ. We are in the end days. We're waiting for the, the trump of God to sound, to be caught out of here. And as soon as the church goes to heaven, to be sealed in heaven for seven years above the great tribulation, the 144,000 Jews will be sealed on earth during the great tribulation. And then at the close of the great tribulation, uh, there'll be the battle of Armageddon, and Jesus Christ will return to the earth. We in our glorified body, bodies will return with him and the battle will set up and then we will have what is known as the thousand year reign of Christ or we refer to as the millennial reign of Christ or as the Bible refers to as uh, the, the, the kingdom of heaven will begin. During that time there will be, no, uh, be no government as of the world. It will be a government under the rulership of Jesus Christ himself. Zechariah 14 says he will rule uh, with a rod of iron, with a rod of iron. What, the purpose of the millennial reign of Christ, the purpose of the thousand year period, the purpose of the kingdom of heaven on earth at that time is to rid the world of sin and of rebellion. Understand that. Jesus Christ will rule and reign the nations of the world as we will see here momentarily. There will still be rebellion, even though the tempter will not be here. The old flesh and body of those unsaved will still be here. And the old flesh, the old carnal nature, the Adamic nature, it wants to rebel against the things of God. You read Zechariah 14, and you will see that Jesus Christ is the judge uh, during that time. And he is ridding the world of all of its sin and all of its rebellion. After the millennial reign of Christ is over, Satan will be loose for a brief period of time. We don't know how long that season is. But he will try again to make his last ditch stand against defeating the Lord Jesus Christ again, but it will not work. And at the close of that period of time, Satan uh, will be thrown into the, to, to, the, to, to, to hell, and death and hell will be cast in the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. There'll be no more sin. There'll be no more tempter. There'll be no more devil. There'll be no more Satan. There'll be no more imps of darkness. Thank God. Peace real peace uh, will have entered into all of eternity just as we had the peace during uh, the millennial reign of Christ. Now, with that being said, if you'll notice the kingdom of heaven is mentioned exclusively in Matthew and it's mentioned 32 different times. Now understand Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels that we have. Matthew portrays Jesus as the king. Mark portrays Jesus as the servant. Uh, Luke portrays Jesus as the Son of Man, perfect man. And then John portrays Jesus as the Son of God. It's fitting that Matthew, who refers to Jesus as the King, all throughout his gospel, 32 times mentions uh, the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the Matthew presents him as the King. The kingdom of heaven is the period of time where Jesus Christ will rule and reign on this earth during that 1,000 years, rather, of uh, the millennial kingdom of heaven. Jesus Jesus talked about, if you remember, uh, the mysteries of what? The kingdom of heaven. You recall that. Now, when Jesus comes again, he'll return to this earth as the king, and he will rule and reign over his kingdom for that 1,000 years upon this earth. Are you with me? Amen. All right. With that being said, the, the volume of Scripture we have, the Old Testament and the New Testament alike, uh, is mentioned the kingdom of heaven. Now, the Bible declares the kingdom of heaven. Notice, if you will, in the New Testament, many scriptures are given on the subject of the return of Christ and his reign upon this earth. More than 350 references in the Old Testament and uh, 320 references in the New Testament deal with the subject of his second coming and reestablishing a reign of peace and righteousness upon this earth. Think about that. 350 references approximately in the Old Testament, 320 references in the New Testament. Sounds to me like God's kind of excited about this thing. Amen. Sounds to me like it's something we need to understand. Sounds to me like it's something we ought to be looking into uh, to know uh, that the devil's not running the show, praise God. Amen. And to know that elected officers, well, no matter where we put them in, not going to run the show forever. We are serving the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. And to God be the glory for now and forevermore. Yeah. Praise God. I notice, if you will, 
Uh, John the Baptist announced the kingdom of heaven, and he said it was at hand. And saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice that Jesus himself announced the kingdom of heaven, and he too said it was at hand in Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Even if you recall, uh, in Matthew 10, 7, the 12 apostles, uh, they announced the kingdom of heaven was also at hand in their ministry. And as you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What if we shouldn't do that today ourselves? I think the world needs to know where it's heading. Yes, they do. Have you ever in your time as, as a Christian seen a world that seemingly was so blinded and didn't care one iota about their soul, about eternity, and about what the church is about? The church is no longer looked upon as a powerhouse. I remember years ago when there was something happening in the world, they would come out and say, the, the news would say, the position of the church says, well, they were always referring to Roman Catholicism. But they would always quote what the church's view was on something. I don't even hear them talk about that anymore. Because we're not looked upon today as a threat. We're not looked upon today as a viable source of information. We're not looked upon today as being anything except a nuisance to people that are not saved in this world. Friends, if we ever needed the power of God in the church's life, we need it today. Right and I pray that we will do what God said, in the last day let His power be poured out, that we might do great exploits for our God. I am so tired of holding the fort. He's not told us to hold the fort. He has told us to storm the gates of hell. I am so tired today of having church services when God said we didn't have meetings with Him where He shows up and He baptizes in the Holy Spirit and the signs and wonders will follow the things of the preaching and teaching of God's Word. I'm so tired of just holding on when God said, let go and let me be God. The world had to see that there was a real Jesus Christ who had died, rose from the grave, and ascended to heaven. And the very first early church preached that. God confirmed it. Signs and wonders followed and they turned the world upside down. What's it going to take today? They won't, don't listen to our rhetoric. They could care less, the world could care less about our knowledge of the Scripture. They want to see the real Jesus stand up. Amen. And the only way the real Jesus can stand up in me is when I sit down and let Him have His way in me. And the only way He can have His way in you is doing the same thing. What I'm saying, if it took the outpouring of the Holy Spirit with signs and wonders to accompany the ministry of the early church, is it going to take anything less than that for the Lord to convince this unsaved world that He's alive today? I believe He said in the last day, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. But He also said in the last day, there will be a great falling away. And sometimes, let's be real, can we just be honest? Sometimes we're straddling the fence of both of them. The devil owns the fence. Why don't we just go ahead and slide over that fence and don't go, don't go ankle deep in this thing. Let's go waist deep. Yeah. Let's go shoulder deep. Yeah. And let's just be immersed in the presence of God. When's the last time, friends, we have really been burdened for a soul that's going to go to hell? When was the last time we really were moved to tears? We're usually moved to anger for what we see sinners do. But when was the real last time we were really moved to tears because we knew that our friend, our neighbor, was not going to make it? You know why? We're in the last days ourselves. And sometimes in the last D-A-Z-E, we're just kind of dazed to what's going on. I don't mean that ugly, but we really are. But I believe that we can tell the people we've tasted of the goodness of the King. Amen. And let me tell you what's going to happen. And then the anointing of God can be upon us while we share that. And we can see people saved and changed by the power of God. It's going to take the miraculous power of God to reach a world, to reach this generation. Right. May we have that. God has given us the power. God's given us that authority. May we use it for His glory and honor. The, the, as you go preach saying the kingdom is in, we need to preach saying the kingdom is in. And every time we show up and we are speaking God's Word and the Lord confirms that, uh, the King of that kingdom is working through us. You see, let me tell you something. The kingdom of God is in us now. There is a literal kingdom coming, but the kingdom of God is in us now. Know you not, ye are the kingdom of God. 
So wherever we show up, the king inside of us can stand up and we can do great exploits for our God. Let's do it for his glory and honor. The 70 were sent out by the Lord Jesus, and he told them to announce that the kingdom of heaven was nigh unto them in Luke 10 and verse 9, and heal the sick that are therein, and say, the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. When they went out and, and, and healed the sick, the kingdom of God was there. I think we need to understand, church, we're not out here by ourselves. When it says, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world, that's more than just pretty words in a book. The king of glory dwells on the inside. What about the testimony of the Old Testament kingdom of heaven? Well, Jesus came first to be the king over a kingdom, as foretold by the Old Testament prophets. The king and the kingdom were real. The king and the kingdom were literal. And the king and the kingdom were actual. The announcement of the kingdom was made by real people talking about a real offer by Jesus, the real king, to Israel, who's a real people and a real nation as well. The announcement was based upon God's revelation of what he gave to the prophet in the Old Testament. Now, in Isaiah, described the kingdom throughout the book. Let me just share a couple uh, of verses, if I may. I don't have these written down, uh, 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 Dakota. But in uh, Isaiah 2, 2, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow into it. In Isaiah 2, 4. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into proning hooks. A nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And then there, and you did have up in Isaiah 9, 7, uh, go to that one. Uh, the Bible said, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David, upon the kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from the henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. In Isaiah 11, uh, 6 and 7, he said, uh, and the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf on the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them, and the uh, cow shall, and the bear shall feed their young, and shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat the straw uh, like the ox. Then it goes on to talk about how the young child will, 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 will lay down on the, the den of the snake. Boy, it better be the millennial. Ain't getting me doing that. It better be the millennial. That's how you got to know it's God, friend. Are you hearing me? It's going to be a time of peace when these animals that fight will be at peace with each other. Can you imagine what it would be like with people? Jeremiah spoke of the kingdom in Jeremiah uh, 23, 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. A king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Again, in the kingdom of heaven, the thousand-year reign, Jesus will be ruling with a rod of iron to rid the world of its sin and of its rebellion. Praise God. Then look with me, if you will, in Habakkuk 2.14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. When's that going to happen? During the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ. Zechariah speaks of a kingdom in Zechariah 14.9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. Shall there be one Lord in his name one and his name is who? Jesus. Not Allah, not Buddha, not Muhammad, King Jesus. Praise God. These are a few scriptures of many that we could mention from the Old Testament to prove uh, that there is that thousand year reign of Christ. Now who is the king who's presented in the Word of God? Well again as you look through the Word of God there's revealed purpose of God to build his kingdom. There is that revealed purpose of God to build his kingdom. God never deviates from the purpose. It's all through the Bible. Notice, if you will, in the Old Testament, there is a prophetic portrait of the Messiah King. In the New Testament, there is a historical portrait of the New Testament King. Let me walk through this with you, if I may, very slowly. He's none other than the promised seed, the Messiah. In the Old Testament, he is pointed vividly. He's referred to clearly. He's referred to succinctly. In Genesis 3.15, he is the seed of woman. In Genesis 9.26, he come through the line of Shem. 
In Genesis 12, 1 and 3, he is to be of the seed of Abraham. Uh, in uh, Genesis 7, 19, he's to be from the seed of Isaac. Uh, in Genesis 8, 14, 15, he is of the seed of Jacob. In Genesis 49, 10, he belongs to the tribe of Judah, and Judah is a very important tribe. In 2 Samuel 7, 12, and 16, he is to be the son of David. And then in Psalm 89, 3, 4, and 35, 37, the son of David is established on the throne forever, ever, and is unconditionally reiterated. It is never going to change forever. It was prophesied it's going to happen forever and ever and ever. And then in Isaiah 11, 1, 2, and 10, uh, again, it's reaffirmed uh, one more time. And for that, we're grateful. The King, Jesus, is presented as the Son of God in the Bible. The Bible clearly speaks of Jesus as the king. In Isaiah 7, 14, 9, 6, and 7, he's to be of divine heritage. In other words, he is not just like any other child. He is to be born of a virgin woman. That does not mean a young woman. It simply meant a woman that never had sexual relationship with a man. And when he was born, his name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. Praise the Lord. How could Jesus Christ be born of a virgin and his blood not be tainted. I am not a gynecologist or any of that stuff, but I have been told through research and so forth that when a child is born, that, or when a child is conceived, the blood does not come from the mother, but rather it comes from the father through all of that. How it works is beyond me. I don't swim that deep. But had it been from Mary, then we would have, we'd have been tainted in sin. That's why the blood of Christ was pure. It did not come from a human being. The Holy Spirit overshadowed, and in the womb of Mary, there became the Son of God. The blood was never tainted. It did not come through the line of Adam, but rather it was the blood of God some way that got there. You figure that out, and we'll have a great time talking about it. Amen. Again, we look in the Word of God, Isaiah 7, 14, 9, 6, and 7. He's to be the divine, uh, divine heritage. Again, uh, His name is Jesus, and He will set upon the throne of the living God. He's Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. The Old Testament said, will God indeed dwell upon the earth? Yep. Oh, He did. <laughs> he came down, and His Son, God, dwell upon the earth. It's amazing to me. In Luke 1, 31 through 33 and 35, that prophecy of Isaiah came to pass again. In Micah 5, 2, his birthplace is announced in advance, and we know that to be Bethlehem. Can you imagine? 800 years before it happened, little Micah. Oh, by the way, in Bethlehem of Ephratah, the Savior of the world is going to be born. 800 years later, it happens. God's got to be in that. God's in the detail. In Matthew 2, uh, 1 and 2, the prophecy of Micah came to pass. He was born king of the Jews. Where? In Bethlehem. Surprise. In Daniel 9, 26, he was to be cut off, but not for himself. It was, he was to die for an offering of sin. Why was he cut off? He who knew no sin became sin. He bore in his body your sins and my sins and nailed them to the cross. He was born to die. And yet all this is fulfillment of the Scripture. Again, we read the Word of God uh, in Psalm 22. His death is described in detail. And the psalmist even cried out, My God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, Jesus, that was prophetic what he would say on the cross, the Son of God, why, God, have you forsaken me? And then you look in Isaiah 53, the death of Christ is again, uh, once again described. Uh, the, the brutal details how that it pleased the Father to bruise him, and how that the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and how that he was so beaten as like a lamb going before a slaughtering house. And he was beaten so bad the form of him, it didn't even look like a man. Prophesy. Uh, Psalm um, uh, 16, there's a prophecy of his resurrection from the dead. And then in Acts 2, 25, 28, Peter quotes the prophecy and affirms the resurrection of Jesus right along with his exaltation. In Luke 19, 11 and 15, Jesus again spoke of parables and revealed the fact he was going away because they thought the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven was going to come unto them immediately and it did not come to them immediately. Once again, the kingdom in Acts 15, 13 through 18 and his return is affirmed. Let me say again. Even in Isaiah, he announced in one verse of Scripture, the king is coming. The next verse scripture right down, he's sitting on the throne in the millennial reign. He did not see the church age of the 2,000 years. 
He, it, was, it was not an open revelation. He didn't see it. But the Old Testament and the New Testament confirm the fact uh, that the church age is here, which was part of the uh, mystery of the, uh, we talked about already. So the king of these scriptures is Jesus Christ. He is the exalted king. He is the literal king. He is the actual king. He is the coming king. He will be a visible king. And thank God this is not symbolic language I've talked to you about. It's reality. King Jesus will return. Amen. Praise God. This same Jesus that ascended shall in like manner descend again. King Jesus will come. Let's look at the kingdom of heaven as a New Testament term real quickly. Again, the kingdom of heaven is only used by Matthew. It's in 32 different places in the book of Matthew. I've got the scriptures, but I didn't put them up because I was back there. You see this? I was typing in one hand. That baby broke all the way through one end to the other. I just found that out today. The kingdom of heaven is limited in time and it's limited, limited in sphere as well. What do I mean by that? Jesus came as a king to this earth when he was born in Bethlehem. They rejected him as a king. As King Jesus, he died as a king, a rejected king. The king was buried, but the king resurrected from the dead. He said, no man takes my life from me. Freely I lay it down and freely I will pick it up again. The kingdom was postponed because Israel rejected King Jesus. It was God's plan that, if you don't know the Old Testament in a nutshell, here it is again. God wanted to have a land. He chose the land of Israel. God wanted to have a people. He chose Abraham to be the father of the Jew and also the father of the Gentile, but he's the father of the Jew. God wanted his people in his land in order that they might receive the scriptures, that they might preserve the scriptures, that they might translate the scriptures, and then they might accept Jesus Christ, and then they were to be the evangelists that were to go to the four corners of this world proclaiming Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because they rejected their king, because they crucified their king, Romans 11 says that God cut them off and grafted in the church, which was never talked about in the Old Testament. He grafted into the church, made up a born-again Jew, and made up a born-again Gentiles. We today, the church, are doing the work that the Jews supposed to have done. That's why the church age is here. If you read the book of Daniel and Ezekiel, Isaiah, and Zechariah, you will find Daniel's 70th week. 69 of those weeks a week representing seven years, 69 of those weeks have already been fulfilled at the time Jesus Christ was crucified. Daniel's 70th week has not came to pass in the last 70 years. But when the rapture takes place, the time clock begins to tick again. And Daniel's 70th week, seven years of tribulation, once again, kickstarts that clock. And that is the fulfillment of the 70 weeks of Daniel. Does you make sense? All right, with that being said, that is when Jesus then, during that seven years, after that, it will kick in the thousand-year reign of Christ. He will then be the king. That's the sphere that he'll be in. The king during that millennial reign, and the time will be for the 1,000 years while he's there upon this earth. Now, what's God's purpose for the earth? Is there to be a kingdom? Acts 1, 6 says, the disciples asked, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the time. It's not for you to know the seasons. So with that being said, the Bible does declare that Jesus will return and he'll set up the kingdom. Thank God we the church will come back with him. Yes. You ever thought what it would be like to be in a glorified body? You know, science tell us now that we could walk through walls with the molecules of our body were just restructured a little bit. But on that day, we will have glorified bodies. I don't know what it will be like. I hope it's a lot smaller. <laughs> Somebody said, with the temple of the Holy Spirit, I don't know about you, I'm a small chapel. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? Get on the scales and say one at a time, please. <laughs> Go to the doctor and say, how, 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 uh, how much you weigh? I said, well, according to the scales, I'm seven foot five inches tall. Anybody have that problem? You're waiting, all that. Anyway, but during that time, uh, we'll have glorified bodies. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but when he appears, when he appears, we'll have a body fashioned like the glorious body of Jesus. That's hard to comprehend. Thank God resurrection is not reconstruction of the old. Resurrection is brand new. And we will rule and reign with him 
for that thousand year period of time. We, the bride of Christ, are heirs with God and we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Praise God. Now, Jesus returns to the earth as King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 19, 16, uh, it says, and hath, and hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Again, he said, he shall come in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So at the end of the battle of Armageddon, Jesus will occupy the throne of David. The battle is described in Matthew 24, Joel, Zechariah, and Revelation. The battle is the conflict between Jesus Christ and Antichrist. The seed of the serpent fighting the seed of woman, as was discussed back in Genesis 3.15. But the doom of the Antichrist, the doom of the false prophet in Revelation 19.20, they will be cast into the lake of fire. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and then that worshipped his image. Those both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Oh, that's a sad day that's going to happen. But the doom is going to come. The doom is going to come to Satan and all those that follow him. Notice that also during that time there will be judgment upon the Gentile nations, and judgment also upon Israel. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter 20, I don't have that written down there on the notes, but in Ezekiel uh, chapter 20 and verse 33, let me share this with you. In my study this afternoon, I found this. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand, with a stretched out arm, and with fury poured out, I will rule over you. And I will bring you out from the people, and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered, with a mighty hand, with a stretched out arm, with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of my people, and there will I plead with you face to face, Likewise, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will plead with you, saith the Lord God. And I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I will purge out from among you the rebels and the transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall never enter into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Again, during the millennial reign of Christ, judgment upon Israel. Judgment upon the nations in Matthew chapter 25, the nations that have not been kind to Israel. A lot of anti-Semitism anti in this land and around the world. But the nation has not been kind. They will reach uh, the judgment of God equally as well. So Satan will be bound a thousand years in Revelation 20 uh, in verse number 2. And the Lord and, and they laid hold of the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now, think about this. The kingdom of heaven lasts 1,000 years. We refer to it in the millennial reign. Again, it's repeated six times in Revelation 20. Let's read it together and underline it. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan bound him a 1,000 years, and cast him in the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should see the nations no more till a 1,000 years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones and that set upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them from my head, the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, which he did, had not worshipped the beast, neither image, neither had received his mark upon the foreheads or their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a 1,000 years." Until, but the rest of the dead live not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part of the first resurrection of such. The second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and the Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when a thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of this prison. He wants us to understand there's a thousand year reign that he's going to be the king in, yes. and we're going to be there with him. I got to hurry. Bear with me just a bit. The kingdom of heaven is that period of time, a thousand years, when Jesus would literally, personally be the king of kings upon this earth. Understand, the only world will ever have peace is when the prince of peace, Jesus Christ, rules. The government will be upon whose shoulders? His. Praise God. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Let me hurry. I want to skip down a little bit if I can. Let me just kind of bring this up into summarization, if I may. What would the conditions of the world look like during this kingdom reign? First of all, Israel shall become the head of all nations. It says they'll be the head and not the tail as she is today, Deuteronomy 28 and following. The church shall reign with Christ during this kingdom of heaven. We read about that in the Bible as well. We will be with him. We will reign with him. We will judge angels. 
Uh, we will carry out details that God wants to carry out. I don't know what we'll do. The Bible doesn't give great detail what we will do in our glorified bodies, but we will reign with Him. We will rule with Him. And whatever He asks us to do, thank God we will do it with joy, I'm sure. Satan will be bound at thousand years. Antichrist, false prophet, will cast a lake of fire uh, before, uh, before Satan. The nations of the world shall worship the Lord, receive no rain. We understand that in Zechariah. People, again, Satan will be bound. But the people will go to Jerusalem to worship. Those that don't, he turns the rainwater off. Zechariah 14 talks about that sockets will consume out of their eyeballs uh, because he's ruling with a rod of iron for those that rebel during that time. The spiritual condition of mankind during, the, during that time, human nature never changes. There will be those that will rebel uh, against the Lord, and he'll have to use that rod of iron against them. I've got to hurry. Satan will be loosed, as I said, at the end of the, of the millennial reign to try to over again overpower Jesus Christ and get many people during that millennial reign that never really submitted to Jesus, maybe gave lip service, but there'll be many that'll still follow uh, Satan after he's loosed for a period of time. Uh, the ones that uh, adore the Lord, thank God, will have it. Uh, they'll be born again. But those that didn't, they also will meet their doom. The physical additions of mankind during that time, life will be lengthened, and some shall live as long as Methuselah, 969 years, if not longer, uh, 969, 970 years maybe, during that thousand years. Isaiah uh, 35, 5, and 6. Uh, he said there, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, uh, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. So again, we know no one will die during that time. Uh, maybe except those that are open rebellion against God, because Isaiah 65, 20, I'm not going to read it, but there it is, uh, talks about those that rebel. They may die during the time of millennial, but death is not the natural thing. Again, to rid the world of sin and rebellion. The physical creation during that age, creation shall be restored. No more famines, no more pestilence, no more an earthquake. In Isaiah 32, 15, which I do not have in the notes, until the Spirit be uh, poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness be fruit fulfilled, and the fruit fulfilled uh, be content for a forest. Isaiah 35, 1, and the wilderness of the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Praise God. So once again, uh, notice the animals. We'll go back, revert back to uh, where the, we said a moment ago that the lion and the lamb will be together. Uh, the child can play upon the, uh, the den of an asp, which is basically the serpents, and it goes on and on. Bear and, and the calf can lie together uh, during that time as well. Isn't that going to be a peaceful time? Yeah. You know what? I don't care where my wife and I go. If it's out in the woods or somewhere, say, that place looks snaky. I, I, I never could pick strawberries back home for fear of the snakes. I just don't like those crazy things. Uh, I've killed 30 some in my house, and I missed one the other day. The brick wasn't heavy enough, apparently, but uh, I, I took a shot at him. But during the millennial reign of Christ, the line of the Lamb will lay down together, praise God. It's going to be wonderful. Again, the kingdom of heaven will be delivered up to God. At the end of the kingdom age, Jesus, having put all things under his feet, Paul said, deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father. And once again, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit may be all in all, Paul said. The kingdom of God is everlasting. The eternal throne of God is everlasting. And Jesus Christ wins this thing once and for all. Lord, there's so much more I want to say. I am so grateful that I am born again. Yes. I am so grateful that God's given me understanding of his word a little bit. Amen. And I am so grateful to know that this thing is not just winding down, for the child of God is winding up. Amen. And I want you to know, church, we're in some unprecedented times, some unprecedented days. And the days that we live in are going to get harder and harder and more difficult and more difficult. But the king of peace can bring peace here. Yes. May not find it in the world now, but it will be here. A peace the world can't give or take away. But when the rapture takes place, we're going to go home. Hallelujah. And then we're going to come back. And he's going to rule for that thousand years. And we'll be kings and priests with him. Tell people about the Lord. 
And brothers and sisters, if you're flirting with sin, if you're living in sin, if you've got habits that can't break, if they're strongholds, you get rid of, have a powwow with God. Talk to somebody, get some help, but don't play around with God. Don't play around with God. Make sure you're clean because he's coming back not for gutter saints, but for glorious saints. Amen. Are you ready? I pray you are. Father.